The last six weeks of my life have been focused on recuperating from a total knee replacement. Most every aspect of the process has involved pain of some sort. In the months before my surgery, when the pain I lived with was because my knee was deteriorating, the common wisdom offered me was to put it off as long as I could. I began to question that logic because it seemed to me that the surgery offered me a new lease on life and putting it off just delayed it. So I scheduled the surgery because the pain of recovery was more attractive than the pain of postponement. Since my surgery, I have followed the common wisdom that the biggest key to my healing is my commitment to physical therapy. That wisdom is proving true and it hurts. Healing hurts. One of the things I've learned in the process is how to differentiate between pain that heals and pain that indicates I'm hurting myself. My therapist continues to remind me that there's a difference between PT and exercising. The point is not for PT to add more weight at every session or do more than I did the last time. The point is to help my knee understand that it's getting better and I will not always hurt like this. As much as I would like to mine what I have just told you for metaphors, the last part is where it all breaks down. Our lives are made up both of the pain that heals and the pain that damages, but we don't necessarily have the choice to avoid the damaging stuff. Life not only hurts us, it often wounds us. I don't want to be so flippant as to suggest that all we have to do is keep doing our exercises and things will get better. They might and they might not, which is exactly the point Jesus was making with his disciples in the verses we just read. Jesus and his disciples were leaving the temple in Jerusalem, a magnificent building that represented the presence of God to the people who lived there. Even under the oppression of Rome, the temple was a tangible assurance that God was with them. The disciples were awestruck. Perhaps you know that feeling. Can you think of a building where you have stood that took your breath away? Trinity Episcopal Church in Copley Square in Boston is one of those for me. Let yourself go to that place as you hear Jesus' words in response to their awe. See these great buildings? Not a single stone will be left on another. Everything will be torn down. A little later, Jesus was with four of them, two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John, and they asked not so much for, clarifica for clarification but for a warning, what are the signs that this is going to happen? Are we going to be able to see this coming? Jesus sort of doubled down with words that read like a Cormac McCarthy novel in many ways, particularly to our American ears, so tuned to fear and distrust. But through the whole chapter, Jesus keeps saying things like, don't be alarmed when, or things like this will happen before he lists some sort of cataclysmic sequence, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes. He makes it sound like Chicken Little was right. But then he says in most translations, things like this must happen, but the end is still to come, which for those of us who've seen too many disaster movies, sounds like an ominous statement. But a better translation would be, but it is not yet the end, or the end is not yet. Which is to say, all these horrible things are not the end of the story. God's story all along has been a story of love. And in the end, 
love wins. Therefore, as we often say, if love has not yet won, it is not yet the end. Then Jesus closes with an image that actually made me chuckle when I thought about it. Jesus is sitting in private with two sets of brothers, James and John, Peter and Andrew. And to that small circle of men, he says, this is only the beginning of the labor pains, which is a wonderful metaphorical way to say that God makes meaning out of our suffering on the one hand. But what I find funny is that he used a metaphor none of them could know experientially. His point was that the pain we experience in life, whether hurtful or healing, is not, is, is not a sign that the pain is all that there is. When things fall apart, when the walls come down, something else happens, something else follows, something else is born, something new. More importantly, God shows up in new ways. Just because the symbols of God's presence that we have counted on are temporary does not mean that the presence of God is temporary. Mark 13, the chapter from which our passage is taken, is often labeled the little apocalypse. Our modern understanding of that word is, is that it means some sort of disaster, the end of the world, as if the world is going to end in the same violence we, to be, we appear to be quite adept at perpetuating. But that's not what the word means at its root. It means an uncovering, a disclosure, a revelation, as if to say, so this is what it all means. Right after we married in 1990, Ginger and I moved from Texas to the Charlestown neighborhood of Boston. Everything felt ancient compared to Texas. The next year we had a chance to go to Paris and we went to Notre Dame, another building intended to symbolize the presence of God. We listened to a tour guide at Notre Dame describe the new rose window that had been installed in the 1500s and smiled. We smiled at all the things we thought were so old in New England. It felt like that the cathedral had and would last forever. It didn't, at least not in its original form. We've gathered in this old building this morning, which was also built as a symbol of God's presence. We are still tentative in our gathering because of the pandemic and the questions it has raised about how we can be together without endangering one another. So we gather, but it doesn't feel like the room we have always known just as the disciples had a hard time imagining how they would know where God was if the temple were destroyed, we're having a hard time figuring out how to be the church when we can't do it in the way we are used to or when our circumstances make it feel like we might not ever get that chance again. Some of us miss the fellowship. Some of us miss the singing. Some of us worry that we won't have enough money to pay the bills. Some of us wonder if our kids will keep things going after we're gone. We aren't having the Harvest Fair this year. By the time we get back to coffee hour, the kids will all be two years older than they were the last time they ran around with a fist full of cookies. None of us knows what lies ahead. And I'm not just talking about church when I say that. We are frightened, anxious, angry, frustrated, depressed. 
in our uncertainty, the symbols of God that are most attractive are those that offer comfort. Yet, what Jesus offered was hope, which is not always comfortable. But Jesus says, means that God is about to be born again in our time and in our culture. And it's going to hurt. Through the pain of my surgery and my recovery, though the pain of the surgery and my recovery in no way compare to what I imagine it feels like to be in labor. The clearest answer I can give to someone when they ask me how things are going is that I'm doing well and it all hurts. The only way to continue to improve is for me to keep hurting. I hurt before the surgery as well, but the bone on bone pain that wouldn't go away was replaced by a pain that offers me hope of being more agile and involved in life. I won't describe exactly what they did to my knee, but suffice it to say they destroyed it and rebuilt it. I'm a construction project. I couldn't stay the way I was and keep walking, so I let them replace my knee, a rather gruesome process that now offers me hope. Our experience of the pandemic over the last 20 months has made obvious what was already true. Things are not going to stay the same. In many ways, big and small, the walls have fallen down. It kind of feels like all the stones of our security have been scattered, but none of those things is a sign that things will end in destruction. The source of our hope in Christ is more profound than perpetuating the things that make us feel safe. The building is not the church. We are the church, the living, breathing body of Christ, the incarnate love of God alive and hopeful in a world far too easily convinced that pain is all there is. Rather than allow ourselves to be swept up in outrage or cynicism or fear, let us choose to remind one another that love is the last word, the best word. Instead of joining the chorus of those that think it is over, let us be midwives for one another, helping to birth hope, love, faith in each other's lives. Amen. Thank you.